Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16. What we have before us is a, a masterful illustration of tremendous import. It's a parable that has been well said, the significance of which can scarcely be overestimated. But here's the problem. Not all agree on just what that significance is. Let's take a look once more in, at the text and, and just consider it with me briefly. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius he, a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Going, about, going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too. And whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, be beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only for an hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied, to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So, the last will be first and the first last. Let me just underscore once again, this is a, a tremendous opportunity for us to highlight the importance of exegesis, which simply means a, a careful, diligent study of the text, the text, the text, the text, in its context, both written and historical, grammatical, so forth. Let me illustrate how important it is to study a passage like this in careful detail. It's a parable. A parable, parabolo, means to throw alongside and illustrate some truth by giving a story alongside that real truth to help, help illustrate it. It's not an allegory. It's not something that you take a word and say, oh, it must mean this. Now, let me give you, there, there are throughout church history, there have been just countless interpretations of this. And I think it's critical that we first understand what it, this is not saying and how it has been used. Again, it's well said that the significance of the parable can scarcely be overestimated, but, but what is that significance? Well, some say that it represents that there are different levels of work, namely that some work more in less time. That's a classic interpretation. In fact, that's how the Jews had a parable of their own. And they said that there was a man who was paid a month's wages in two or just for a few hours of work. And the, the answer the rabbi gave was because he did more work in those two hours than the multiple months or a, a month's worth of work from the others. Traditional Roman Catholic interpretation of this takes that view primarily and says, that essentially those who are compensated at the end of the day are compensated for their missing works by increased faith. So really the earlier ones represent those who do the greater workload and the later ones represent those who supplement their work with faith. That's one view. Another view is redemptive history. They say this is an allegory about redemptive history. In other words, uh, very early on, some of the church fathers were actually saying, look, there are five different groups of people, five different laborers. 
And those five different laborers, well, they actually represent Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Christ. That's allegorical interpretation. It's completely baseless and has no founding in the text whatsoever, just like the last one. In fact, the last one, as again, some working more than others, is completely against the entire motion of this passage. So it's not about more work and less time. It's not about uh, an allegory of redemptive history. Some say it's an allegory of spiritual progress, like the stages of a Christian's life. From crude obedience, where it's sort of you start out legalistic and you grow to understand it's actually by grace. That's a clever effort, but completely unfounded in its context and nowhere supported by anything said in the parable. Well, there's a fourth interpretation that says, and this one's very popular, very common, preached today. Um, and it says, basically, well, this is, this is the, the first are the Jews and the last are the Gentiles. You see, I mean, doesn't it make sense? You've got the Old Testament, you've got the New Testament, you've got, the, you've got the, Gentile, the, the Jews have been faithful to God, or at least they were appointed by God to labor for him in his vineyard, because the vineyard always represents Israel. So it's them laboring for God for so long, and then here comes Christ, and now these, you know, Johnny-come-lately Gentiles are being added in in the last hour, and they're going to get the same rewards. That, that's how this is often presented. In fact, there's a Jewish parable that, that sort of supports this idea in a different color. The Jewish parable says that God will give Israel a large reward for their long work. But the parable says the Gentiles who have only worked a little will receive a very little reward. The whole point here about Jews and Gentiles, number one, is foreign to the text. There's nothing in this entire chapter or surrounding chapter that deals with the Jew-Gentile issue. Uh, the, the issue was sparked by a rich young ruler who is a Jew coming to Christ, asking about eternal life, and he walks away. This makes no sense to say this is about Jews and Gentiles. It's answering Peter's question about what will we receive because we have left everything to follow you. So what will we, we, we receive? He's not going to talk to him about Gentiles. That's not the point. Fourth, or no, this would be fifth. Uh, many would say that, no, it's actually about an equal willingness, an equal willingness to follow Christ. That you have difference of times and people becoming Christian, but it's, it's addressing equal willingness. In fact, this is a quote from one commentator. God takes into account not only the work we do, but also our opportunities. So it's about the willingness of the laborers. That's what it this view says. This goes all the way back to the fourth century as well, where one of the commentators then said, God looks not on the actual work done, but on the inner willingness to work and to sacrifice that lies behind it. This is to extol that the 11th hour workers had a willingness to work the whole day, so they got paid for the whole day. <laughs> well, First of all, there's absolutely nothing stated whatsoever or even hinted to concerning the worker's willingness. There's nothing in the passage about the 11th hour worker's willingness. In fact, there's nothing about how they respond to the payment. It's not about how willing a person is to receive something they deserve. No. So then the sixth view would be that some say that, well, then this is about the denial of rewards. This is, this is the great leveler. It's to say, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be chasing after rewards because that's mercenary. So this is, this is a denial of any kind of special rewards. And it, in other words, the idea here is that, you know, the, the difference between uh, between people and different giftedness doesn't result in different rewards. And they major on verse 12, which says, you have made them equal to us. Well, that is 
that is true, that that is said. But what's strange about this view of equal rewards is um, it doesn't fit here anything to do with the thrust and the question and the answer and the context and where it's going and what the purpose is to the disciples and the idea of them asking, Peter asking, well, we've left everything, what's for us? In comparison to a man who walked away. It's not comparing what different believers have. Follow me on this. Those are, those are some views that are really quite baseless. They have no grounding in the text or its context. Um, but there are other views that have been, that are preached today that, that are true. They, they, they preach truth theologically, but, but not the point of the passage. One example would be very close to the last one, and that is, is this a denial of all differences in heaven? That's how some take it. They say it this way. It's this, pa- this parable is about the equality of the kingdom of God. It's about the equality of heaven. All people will be treated equally in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, one commentator says this, and I quote, The parable of the laborers in the vineyard highlights for us the fact that any investment we make in the works of the kingdom of heaven receive its reward, and that the reward is the same for everyone. Well, let me make this point very, very clear. It is true that there is a most fundamental reality to the idea that that. The glory of salvation is a blessing that offers eternal life the same to all. In other words, grace is a great equalizer. Heaven will not be marked by the differences of how one person is greater than the other because of something in them. Uh, Let me make this clear. None are more saved than another. All are equally, if they are children of God, all are equally justified, equally accepted to God, equally washed by the blood of the Lamb, equally clothed in His righteousness. All are equally adopted by God and in that sense have a perfectly equal standing before Him. All are His children. And he does not pick favorites and is not impartial or impartial towards anyone. So I would say the most important factor of all is that, yes, there is a a profound truth that that it's the same Jesus. And there's, what more could you have? You, You can't talk about more. I've got more because... If you've got Jesus, you've got it all. So so there's a sense in which absolutely equality is is a significant understanding of heaven. But I ask this very important question. Is that the point of this passage? No. That misses the point of the passage. It's to place the accent and the emphasis in the wrong place. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me say it this way. Where's the good news in that? That's not good news. That's not going to answer Peter's question and his quandary. What's happening? What are we going to get? Oh, it's all equal. All equal to the, the, rich, the rich young man who walked away? Is that, is that the context? No. Another interpretation says that it's about church membership. This one's an interesting one. It's to, this is preached to uh, rebuke the the smug sense of seniority among Christians who comfortably sit in nice, um, you know, 21st century sanctuaries and claim their seats and treat newcomers as like they're second class citizens. Um, Well, that's true. You should, that's a, that's a, a grotesque reality and it's something that should be strongly rebuked, but that's not the point of this passage. It's entirely foreign to the concept of what Jesus is talking about and what Peter would have heard. Well, two more quick ones. Uh, Another is deathbed conversion. This, This says, well, this is actually an allegory of human life and times of conversion. 
So uh, there are those who, who come to Christ early in life, the first, and there are those who come to Christ at the 11th hour. This would be like John, the apostle, and the thief on the cross. And both of them, both of them are equal before God. And it's true. That's true. These are true. But that's not the point of the passage. This is not the point of the passage. It's completely foreign to the context. It doesn't answer Peter's question. It doesn't explain what Jesus means when he says the first will be last and the last will be first. It's not there. Well, the last and probably the, the, the most common interpretation is going to be, today anyway, is the length of discipleship. Very close to the last one. The last one dealt with conversion. This one deals with service. Like those who serve the Lord the longest. Those who walk with Jesus the longest. They interpret this to check against pride and say, look, Peter, you've been with me the longest and there will be, there will be latecomers coming to me and you need to check your pride and make sure that you treat them as equals. And it is true that whether you've served the Lord for a thousand years or one minute, justification is the great leveler. You will stand with equal footing before the holy. It is true that salvation is an equal blessing granted life. It's true, but it's foreign to the context. The question being asked by Peter is, what will we receive for what we have given up? The answer Jesus just gave him is many who are first will be last and the last first. And then he gives this parable. The point is, Peter asked that because he just heard and witnessed a rich man who appears to be blessed by God, a rich man asking Jesus, how can I have eternal life? And he walks away. He walks away. It's not about how long you serve Christ. Peter's not asking, well, am I going to get more than him because I've been serving longer? That's not the question. That's not Jesus' answer. I hope that this has been helpful to see how you should read the scriptures to question and challenge. and Don't just believe what you read in a commentary. This is critically important to understand what this is saying in its own context. Let me just summarize a few points very plainly. It, it's not about laboring in the kingdom of God. It's not about the vineyard being the work context of God's people. It's not about working in the vineyard. It's not about being in the church of Christ. It's, it's not about priorities or superiorities of people. It's not about ranking who's first and who's last. And note that because I'll come back to what does he mean then by that? It's not about gifting who's gifted differently. It's not about service. It's not about the quality of the work done. It's not about the length of time. Calvin rightly says, Christ does not here argue either about the equality of the heavenly glory or about the future condition of the godly. That's not what the parable's about. Some have said that they take the parable and they, and they take all the little pictures used and they, they draw lines out to meaning. So the vineyard is the kingdom, the landowner is God, the foreman is Christ, the laborers are believers, the denarius is eternal life, workday is the believer's lifetime of service, and e the evening is eternity. But I would caution, along with John Calvin, who says, if any man should resolve to sift out the exactness every portion of this parable, his curiosity would be useless. And therefore, we have nothing more to inquire than what was the design of Christ to teach. He's right. We come to the parable as just that. It's, it's a story not intended to give us meaning at every point in the story, but a story that gives meaning to one statement, namely 1930. Chapter 19, verse 30. 
Many who are first will be last and the first and the last first for the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says this statement, Peter, there's my answer. What will you get for giving everything up? Here's my answer. For because the kingdom of heaven is like this story. So it's not that we're supposed to take the story and every little point draw out meaning, but rather get the meaning of the story that's answering, explaining, illustrating his main point. J.C. Ryle said, In expounding this parable, we need not inquire closely into the meaning of the denarius or the marketplace or the foreman or the hours. He's right. And amazingly, Chrysostom, I say amazing because this this is back... In the 400s, Chrysostom said this, It is not right to search curiously and word by word into all things in a parable. But when we have learned the object for which it was composed, we are to reap this and not to busy ourselves about anything further. Well, I agree with all of those. And I think this parable especially brings this to to a powerful light. So I ask this question, what if all the details in the parable, the vineyard and the landowner and and, and the workers, early ones and the last ones, what if all those details were all composed to make one picture? What if they were all composed to make one central point? What if... What if they were all together? They had to be together. Like, like you don't eat a chocolate chip cookie to taste the baking soda. In fact, you don't even need to know baking soda is part of the ingredients. But, but the chocolate chip cookie is the point. So all of these are ingredients. We're not supposed to draw meaning out of the baking soda and meaning out of the sugar and meaning out of the flour. We're supposed to take all of it together, bake it up. Ah. Oh. There it is. It all becomes one. It's like, you know, it's like decoding something. You don't take each little hint and say there's meaning in the hint. No, the hint is to get to the decoding, is to get to the answer. It's kind of like a Rubik's Cube. You know, when you finish a Rubik's Cube, you got nine little squares looking at you. You don't look at them and say, I wonder what that one means. No, the point was you turn it around to get the face of it all the same color. Now you got it. You got it. So all these are are like points on the Rubik's Cube pointing to one big color, one big message, one big statement. What is it? So what is it? Well, I'm going to say this. Time is a, is, it trips everyone up, it seems, almost everyone. Most expositors here want to explain this, and they get tripped up on the time element. I want to just lay this out right at the beginning. That time is an example of what I just said about an ingredient. It is essential for the main point to be fully baked. It is essential for, as an ingredient to the cookie. It's essential, but it's not, it is not something to be tasted. It's not the application. Time is necessary to arrive at the right conclusion, but it's not what the conclusion is about. So if we can take that to heart, and let's move into it. What is, what is the parable about. What is the point then? <laughs> I've just spent all this time what, saying what the point is not. What is it then? Well, let's walk through the text. A little different sermon style. I just want to bring you into this because it is so worthy of our careful study. Let's walk through. Verse 1 through 7 is all set up. Verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven. The 4 connects to what was just said. The kingdom of heaven tells us there is a principle that Jesus is is getting at in this story. The cookie, the cookie is something about the good news that he has come to proclaim, that he has sent his disciples out to proclaim. And remember, the good news is not yet understood as the cross, but the kingdom of heaven is like this. So it's something about the good news of the kingdom. Verse 2. This idea of after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius, that is establishing a fair wage. Verse 4, whatever is right, I will give you. Dikaios, 
whatever is just, whatever is right, whatever is righteous, dikaios, whatever is right. The landowner establishes what is right. And to them, he said, you go into the field, into the vineyard too. And that word too implies that those who were hired late in the day witnessed those who were hired earlier. Two, like the ones you saw, you go to. Verse six, he went out and found others standing. This is so great. The Greek grabbed me here because the tense is odd. It trips you, makes you stop and say, what, why? So, so the tense is putting emphasis on the character of this landowner. The, 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 the emphasis here is he is purposeful and intentional. He's going and he's going with this intent to find. And he found them. Verse seven, they said to him, because no one has hired us. And in verse three and in verse six, we hear the word idle and we, we that can be a misleading word to use for here. And, and the reason why is because the word does not mean the guy's loafing. It means that he's without work. It, it doesn't mean he's lazy. It doesn't mean that he's avoiding labor. It means he doesn't have work. The, the, the point then of verse three and verse four and verse three and verse six and now verse seven answers the point. The reason they were, quote, idle was not by their choice. They weren't squandering something. They weren't lazy. They, 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 no one chose them. They weren't chosen for the job because no one has hired us. All right, so that's all the setup. So it breaks down nicely. The parable, half of it, roughly half of it is set up and half of it is for the main point. So here's the central point, starting verse 8 to 15. Look at verse 8. And when evening came, all that's for is to say it's a full day. It's not to allegorize anything. It's just, it's just to make the point, to punctuate the story. Okay, here's the setup. Now it's been a full day from early morning to evening. The owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, the foreman there is, it's just an artifact of great storytelling. How else are you going to hear what the owner is thinking? You're not going to hear what the owner is thinking unless he says something. So he says it to a foreman, but the foreman has no significance. And he's in fact never seen or do, doing anything here. It's all very, very just kind of vague. He, he's just a prop for the sake for us to hear to hear this, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. He exists so we could hear that. And that's beautiful. And by the way, take a note of this in verse eight, where it says, pay them their wages. The Greek is a little more uh, particular. It's pay them the wage, singular, singular article, singular noun, the wage. In other words, there's already a hint here that there's one wage going out. You pay them the wage. Start with the last ones. And that's critical, isn't it? It's crucial. It's part of the main lesson. This is getting into the main point. It's getting to the taste of the cookie. What are we supposed to taste? We're supposed to start feeling something here that it's crucial that he's now saying, start with the last. Why? Why is that so crucial in verse 8? Why? Because look at 1930. Many who are first will be last and the last first. Look at 2016. The last will be first and the first last. There's something critical right in the middle of those two where he draws out the importance of starting with the last. There's a great reversal that he's wanting us to feel. It's haste. Verse 9, And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. I want you to note this. The Holy Spirit was pleased, Christ was pleased not to make a hint about how they responded. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that striking? No reaction is recorded from them. Nothing. We know nothing about if they smiled, if they cried, if they celebrated, nothing. Just they, they were given a denarius. And what? why? Because the purpose of the story is not to dwell there. 
The purpose of the story is swiftly to move our attention to direct us to the main characters who occupy most of the second half of the parable, namely verse 10. Now, when those hired first, you notice how he just skips right over all the in-between. There are five groups of laborers. He starts with the last. We know nothing about how they respond. And he jumps over everyone else and gives all attention to how the first respond. The emphasis is strong here. Um, Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. That's, we're, we're hearing what they're thinking. We didn't even hear what the last one said or did, but we're hearing what the first ones were thinking. We're hearing what they're thinking. They're thinking, okay, based upon what they got, let's see, wow, they worked one hour. They got a full day's labor, a uh, full day's wage. We worked 12 hours. We're going to have like two weeks wages. We're going to get more, even if it wasn't two weeks. They're thinking, we're going to get more. But the grammar is really strong here. It emphasizes kayatoi. They also, to ana denarion, they also the same denarius. They also the same denarius. Verse 11. And on receiving it, they grumbled. We're hearing what they think, we're hearing how they act, and we're also hearing what they say. There's a lot of focus on this first group. And uh, indeed, it's been well said that little seems more unequal than equal treatment of unequals. (laughs) Yeah. But where is the grumbling directed? Where is the complaint filed? Well, it's not at the last It's at the master, at the master of the house. Verse 12, saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us. Notice what they said. They and you, they did this and you are doing this. In fact, the word in the Greek for do is for both of them. They did, you do? Really? You're going to do this on the basis of what they did? And they register two complaints on the basis of what they did, what they themselves. They say, uh, equal to us who, A, have borne the burden of the day, bastazo. That means to carry a burden like a mule would carry a load. It's the idea of carrying a burden like it was hard. Like Jesus, when he said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, who are weary and heavy laden, heavy laden, burdened. Second complaint they give is the scorching heat. So it's not only the time that they were under a burden, but the conditions of the burden. All day they bore the burden and and, and the the nature of what they experienced was like one of the translations said, they sweated the whole day in the blazing sun. And here we go. The whole point of the parables now come to the great storyteller's climax. Because now we hear the landowner and he speaks. Verse 13. And the point here, and I want you to catch this. If we're going to understand the parable, if we're going to understand Jesus, the point is he's saying, and he's a masterful storyteller, isn't he? Because, I mean, the point is he tells the story in such a way that that we actually listen and we, we, we get drawn in and we actually begin to side with the wrong side. We actually begin to think, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I see the point. And right here, masterfully, he switches everything on us. And what he exposes and shows is, yeah, if you follow that line of thinking, here's the deal. In terms of your view of the kingdom, in terms of what you will receive, Peter, in terms of how anyone gets eternal life, in terms of what we're doing going to Jerusalem, in terms of my mission, You're thinking like a man, and you're thinking man-centered. So when when this landowner responds, it's a 
pivotal point in the story to shift the whole thing upside down to say, put away your man-centered thinking and begin to think like God. Begin to think God-centered, like the prophet Isaiah. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. This is a fitting illustration of that prophecy. Here's the issue. Jesus is reframing their thinking. He's, he's, he's shifting categories and turning things upside down. Here's how. He doesn't respond on their terms. They're crying for their rights. He doesn't respond on their terms. He, he puts in a new frame of reference, and the new frame of reference is not them, but him. Interesting. He says, friend. Now, that, that is taken... That's interesting. I find that interesting. It's only used a couple times, this term, friend. It's, uh, it's a striking word that hetairos, it's, um, it's not the normal word for friend. And sometimes we take it and we read it and, and in English just doesn't get it. It doesn't carry the weight. It doesn't impact the heart. No, no. This isn't about saying, okay, we're friends. No, 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 no. Let me give you an example of where this is used in Matthew. It's used also in 22.12. And it's used in 2650. In 2212, it's the king who's addressing a man who doesn't have wedding garments and is in the banquet. And he's thrown out. Hmm. And the other place that Matthew uses it is in 2650, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Judas comes to give him a kiss. And he calls him friend. No, this seems to be something that um, actually is a bit of a, a twist. He seems to be addressing them as you assume one thing. On the surface, it looks like one way, but really something else is happening here. Here the accuser becomes the accused. They were accusing. He's going to flip the tables they will be accused. And here's how he does it. He shows that the landowner is one of high integrity, one of justice, one of dikaios, one of righteousness, who is right. He has done no wrong. That's what he says. Uk adiko, I have done nothing wrong. I've done nothing unjust. I've done nothing unrighteous. I've done nothing unright. Here, this is, this is fair. I've done only what is fair. They're complaining, this isn't fair. He says, I've, I've, only, I've done only what is fair to you. Did you not agree with me? Did we not agree? <laughs> you work for me, I give you a, a day's wage. You work a full day, I give you a full day's wage. Didn't we agree? Isn't that justice? In the Old Testament, injustice. Injustice was when an employer said, I'll pay you this for this labor. And when this labor was fulfilled, he didn't pay. He didn't pay the amount he promised. This landowner said, no, no, that's not me. Don't, don't say I'm unfair. Don't say I'm not just. I am just here. Verse 14. He, he, he begins to apply something, and it's a bit odd to me because it's a bit odd to tell someone to take something and to go and then to keep talking to them. So there's something stronger happening than just go. He wants them to hear it with weight. He says, verse 14, take what belongs to you and go. And, and this, is, this is powerful. In the Greek, you can see this lineup where it's, it's about belonging. He says here in verse 14, what belongs to you. And then in verse 15, what belongs to me. And right in the middle of what belongs to you and what belongs to me is this idea of, I choose. I choose. If it belongs to me, I choose. I've done you no wrong. I choose. So what this means when he says take what belongs to you, it's set up in contrast to what belongs to him. In other words, they earned it. And go. In other words, don't stand around complaining and looking for more. 
It reminds us of what Jesus taught when he said in the Sermon on the Mount three times, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Hypocrites who do things to get the reward from their labor, they receive their reward, take it and go. And then he strongly comes in with this, I I choose, I choose. It's not your choice to tell me what to do with what is mine. We made an agreement. I fulfilled the agreement. I stand by my word. I'm faithful to what I say. I have the choice. I can choose to do what I want with what is mine. I choose to give to the last what I gave to you. This is powerful because it, he's contrasting two things. One is what he has bound himself to, dikaios, what is right. He bound himself to an agreement and then compares that and contrasts that to what he phileo, what he wills, what he wants. Ooh, this is good. You see, both of those are important with God. Justice is something he, he binds himself to. Justice is something that, that emanates from his very nature and character. He cannot go against his word. He cannot go against his own righteousness. He will by necessity be just. But that is in no way, in no way incompatible with his phileo, his will, his desire to go above and beyond what is just to be gracious. And that's his point, isn't it? I mean, that's verse 15. Am I not allowed? Do I not have a right? You see, they're crying for their rights. And he says, no, it's not about your rights. It's about my rights. Am I not, do I not have the right to do what I choose, what my will desires, what I want, what I delight in? With what belongs to me? I love this. Literally, it's translated, or is it not permitted for me to do whatever I will or wish in such that are mine? And then he says this, and and literally it reads, or is your eye evil because I am good? Paneras. Are you, is your eye evil because I am Agatha, because I'm good? It's translated here, or do you begrudge my generosity? The translators put begrudge because, well, an evil eye in Matthew 6, 23 references, yeah, an eye that is envious. In fact, it's translated envy in Mark 7, 22. And in the writings between the Old and New Testaments, the Jews wrote this, the eye of the greedy person is not satisfied with his share. An evil eye is an envious I. And that brings us to the end where Jesus sums up the story and then as he takes it out of the oven, he hands it to Peter and says, here's what I mean. So the first or the last will be first and the first will be last. And he flips them. 1930 and six and 2016 are flipped so that they make this connection Here's what I mean. Taste that. So what's the point? Let's just close with these thoughts. Let's let's seek to understand the point better. Here's where I think we need to really start. Is what comes just natural to the hearers. Natural to Peter. Natural to James and John. Natural to all the disciples. Natural to you. Natural to me. And it goes something like this. Well, especially in our day, (laughs) Um, first come, first serve. I mean, we earn what we get and we get what we earn. Isn't that a good ethic? I mean, I was raised to say that, you know, I had to buy my first car. I had to pay for insurance. I had to do all this stuff, no handouts. And the reason why was because I I was, it was pounded in my head that you must work for what you receive or you will not appreciate it. So paying in college and going through that, and I'm watching other people, you know, get these full rides from their parents, and, and there's a bit of, why are you getting that? Ah, anyway, it doesn't matter, because I'm going to appreciate it more. <laughs> Let me just make this clear. This parable is not a lesson on civics, 
It's not a lesson on economics. It's not a lesson on business ethics. That would be disastrous to try to take this and say, here's a good model for an employer. You'd go bankrupt. That's insanity. That's nowhere taught as an ethic of how to live life. This isn't, this isn't an ethic for how to, some try to say, well, then it's an ethic for how to live in the kingdom of God. That's not the point that Jesus is telling Peter. I think closer to the issue is what a universalist said, believe it or not, way back in Massachusetts. It's an amazing thing. I'll read it. The way by which we come more thoroughly to know and appreciate blessings is by earning them. And especially if we sacrifice and perhaps suffer in the attainment. Inherited wealth is not so thoroughly appreciated by those who come into its possession as by those who earn it by hard toil and persistent endeavor. (laughs) Well, the question I have is, for us to understand this, we need to examine our glasses. We need to ask the question, how are we looking at the passage? How are we looking at... God, how are we looking at, the, at life? How are we looking at ourselves? Do we look with eyes of entitlement and desert and justice? Or do we look through the lens of grace? You see, this tells the story in a way to get you on that side of justice, on that side of what's right. So I ask you, do you identify with the first or the last laborers? I mean in the way you process life. I mean in the way you feel, even right now. Like, we deserve to go to church. We, it's our right. You identify with that side? Or do you see yourself as though you deserve last place, as though you deserve nothing and you actually have received first place and you got everything. Is that how you feel? You see, this whole story invites us to examine where am I in that? Because isn't that what's on both sides? Let me tell you, Peter, what you'll get. First will be last, last will be first. Last will be first, first will be last. Here's what it tastes like. You see, we live in an entitlement generation, and um, I mean, everyone seems to be raving about rights. My rights, this right, this right, this right. We, we, we are so engrossed by rights. Every, I mean, this, this message, the point of the second half of the parable is all about one simple principle. That's not fair. That's what it's about. That's not fair. So Peter What will we get? Jesus, let me tell you a story. It's going to taste like this. That's not fair. I mean, you don't teach kids that, do you? you, I've never sat my kids down and said, okay, listen, when your brother takes that toy from you and you did nothing to deserve that, make sure you yell out, that's not fair. Never had to do that. Never. You just don't need to teach it because that's like instinctive to a self-oriented life. I deserve. It's not fair. It's not right that they have and I don't. In fact, I worked more. Why do they have and I don't? I mean, let's think about this in our social justice environment. This is massive discrimination (laughs) all over the headlines of the United States of America. Who in the world would (laughs) applaud this story? No one. That's not fair. You go to court for things like this. Why did you choose those other guys first? What, is it the color of their skin? Is it because they're male or female? Is it depend on the ethnicity? That's not fair. Why, Why are you choosing like, why are you discriminating? I mean, this brings lawsuits and union strikes. I mean, the, the, union, the workers' union would have a fit with this. 
This, is, this would call for social justice. This is not fair. I mean, it's not fair. Well, let me... Let me just make this clear. It's not a lesson on justice. It's a lesson on grace. Peter, what will I get for all that I gave up? And Jesus, well, gee, it's like this, Peter. Taste this. You don't deserve anything. You will get. This isn't about justice. This isn't put up for us to calculate why the landowner treated the first ones the way he did. That, that's not the point. Now, I ask this question once again How is this parable good news? Because if it's Jesus going around talking about the good news of the kingdom, how is it good news for the first laborers? How is it good news? It's not good news. It's not good news for those who work. It's not good news. The parable is not good news for those who work. The parable is only good news for the 11th hour. The, the point is, if you think you deserve what you're going to get, Peter, it's not grace. And those who come into my kingdom come only by grace. It's not fair. Oh, that's right. It's not fair. It's grace. Let me, let me just try to persuade your heart if you're not seeing this yet. Uh, let me just run down. I made some observations. Notice this. He starts out with the day laborers who did not have work. And that's why he keeps talking about he goes back and keeps finding people without work. What's the point? A day laborer wasn't even, wasn't even on par with a slave. Why? Because a slave at least had security that he'd get food in his mouth from his owner. A day laborer didn't. He didn't work. He didn't eat. And if he didn't eat, he could die. So the point is, they are totally dependent on being chosen. Second, the landowner sought them out. They didn't seek the landowner. The landowner sought them out. Third, he speaks to the foreman and tells him, I want you to start reversing the order. Re completely overthrow all human expectation because my ways are not their ways. Next, the reaction of the last isn't even reported because the point is to capture the, what's going on in Peter's heart. It's to capture what's in your heart and my heart. Namely, that we grumble against grace. How about the fact that the middle group isn't even mentioned? Because that's not the point. It's not about how he divvies up. The point is all about desert and complete undeserved gifts. Or how about the words they thought they would receive more? Because they looked at what others were blessed with. Like looking at a rich man and all of his blessings or the rich man himself being so blessed and thinking, I, I should get a lot. They grumbled. When they say, when Jesus says what belongs to you versus what belongs to me, that's a statement of distinction over what is grace and what is deserved. When he contrasts evil and good, it's to point out it's all of grace. And when he deals with this first and last, I, I really, I want to stress this in a moment. In fact, we'll just look at it with me right now. Look at verse, uh, again, 1930, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And the parable ends with, so the last will be first and the first last. So whatever the meaning of the first one, it's the same as the meaning of the second one. And what is that meaning? It's answering Peter's question. What is that meaning? Well, it's to say, Peter, in contrast to the rich man, this is what you're going to get. Maybe it would help us if we looked over just a few verses down and look with me at verse 26. It shall not be so among you. Same exact 
audience, the disciples. It shall not be so among you. What? What? Not the world's way of doing things. It shall not be so among you. Why? But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. That's first, last, last verse. And then he says this amazing punctuating reality, even as the son of man came to be, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. Now that's in the context. He's explaining there what he means by first and last. Don't take on a first mentality because I'm first, but I came to lay my life out for you. And it's all of grace. So don't take a first mentality. What are you going to get, Peter? Let me tell you, it tastes like this. And nothing of it is what you deserve. Nothing. Here's the issue. The chapter began with, with the disciples saying it's better not to marry. And then moving on to children, rebuking everyone. Get the kids out of here. They're not, they're not important. We're dealing with real stuff here. And each, each step, Jesus is saying, you're proud. You're proud. And then it moves into the rich man. And he's an idolater. And then we hear Peter, well, then what will we get? Oh, and beloved and friends, it does not end there. Look next at the very next verse, right after 16. What, does, what happens? Jesus was going to Jerusalem and he took, up the 12, he took the 12 disciples aside. It's as though this story is lingering in our hearts and Jesus takes the boys aside and he says this. I can only sense the solemnity. He says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified and he will be raised on the third day. And that has everything to do with how the cookie tastes. It has everything to do with what he means when he says the first will be last. The context is very clear. It's not about how long you serve or no rewards. The point is, Peter, what will I get for what I have done? Well, Jesus says, let me tell you, it's kind of like this. The kingdom of heaven is like A scandal. A scandalous situation. People who didn't work got a full reward. People who were last were paid first. Let me tell you what it's like, Peter. The Son of Man is going to die for you. You think it's what you gave up? How about what I give up? You you want to talk about your rights? What about my rights? All you deserve is justice. Are you with the first or with the last? You see, that's the story. That's the point. And what really sort of sickens me is this. We have grown so accustomed to grace that we actually consider grace fair. We think about grace now as fair, as right. And we do it so much that when grace is not given to us, we complain and say, that's injustice. What? We actually call not giving grace, call it Injustice. That's how insane we have become. Just like the first. R.C. Sproul tells a story that illustrates this well. As a professor teaching in a class, students were told, listen, you need to turn this paper in by Friday, and if you don't have it on my desk Friday morning, you fail the paper. Of course, student comes Friday. Oh, Dr. Sproul, I I didn't, I'm I'm really sorry, this and that and the other thing, and I I, I can't, can you please let me turn it in Monday? He says, I told you. He says, I know, I know, I know, please. All right, all right. 
It happens again with more people. The third time, there's a little line of students Friday morning, and they come up, oh, Dr. Sproul, please. And he looks at them and he says, no. And what do they do? That's not fair. You did it for him. Oh, so now you're saying by not giving grace, I'm actually acting unrighteous? I'm being unjust? <laughs> no. We had an agreement. What about my rights? That's what is probably the most disturbing. Let me just close this with this point. I entitled the message, The Outrageous Kingdom, because I want us to think in terms of what does he mean by the kingdom of heaven is like? Well, clearly the focus he gives is the outrage of the first. The outrage against grace. The outrage that Peter might feel. The outrage. The parable is calculated to confront, even to offend pride. That's why first will be last. You see, but it will only offend those who think they deserve more. It only offend those who think that salvation is a payoff for things done. The kingdom of heaven is like a scandalon, kind of like the uh, prodigal son. Do you remember that? A lot of parallels there, isn't there? Father and employer, two sons, two groups of workers. Interesting. You have the father look to the one son and give him grace and do nothing wrong to the other son. But that other son complains. Same thing here. What's the point? Well, it's just like Jonah. The story of Jonah, remember? I mean, amazing. He goes to Nineveh and he says, he tells God, I didn't want to go. Why? Because I know that you're, you're a God abounding in, in mercy and steadfast love and forgiving sinners. I know you'll, you'll forgive them if they repent. And because of that, I don't want to go. And when God forgives Nineveh after they repent, it says this in Jonah 4.1, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. He was outraged. This was a scandal. How can God forgive? Here's the issue. It's offensive. And who, who would blame Corey Ten Boom when, when later on she's given a, she's given a conference, a seminar, and, and one of the guards who, who abused her and her sister and mocked them and threatened them, who comes up in tears and shakes her hand and asks for forgiveness, and she is frozen stiff and can't reach out. Who's going to blame her? It's hard to forgive someone like that. I mean, what is right anyway? Isn't it right that people get what they deserve? Isn't that right? I mean, can you imagine God forgiving a serial murderer when one of your children were the victims? Or, or genocide dictators like Hitler and Stalin and Mao, and, or pedophiles or sexual predators or, or a clan member? Or could you imagine God just forgiving skinheads and drug dealers and terrorists and any other group that is gross and vile sins that we can't relate to? Can you imagine people like that not being punished for their crimes? It seems wrong. And here's my point. Here is what I think Jesus is giving in what he gives to Peter as a whole. And here's the point. Until you are offended by grace, you do not understand it. Until you are offended by grace, you will not rightly celebrate it. Until you are offended by grace, you will not think and live it. You need to understand you deserve nothing from God but his wrath against sin. Your sin. We don't deserve to gather as a church. We don't deserve any of the blessings we have. We, we are children and have only one claim. Every one of us is the 11th hour. Every one of us. All day long in our lives. 
We can't provide for ourselves. We can't do it. We can't work it. There's no, we can't come to him. He must come to us and, and he must look upon us and say, go, go. And I'll pay you first and I'll give you the most. I'll give you the, the, the fullness of it all. This, beloved and friends, is what Paul meant when he said, the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block, a scandal on. This is what Peter meant when Peter says in 1 Peter 2.8 that Jesus is a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. That's what he means. The kingdom offer, the good news of the kingdom is offensive because it tells people you don't deserve it. Let us not live a calculating spirit. You know, one thought here, and I'll promise I'll close. I like this acronym. I don't usually like acronyms, but this one's okay. Mark it down, grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. You see, the point is nobody worships an employer who pays them their wage that they earned. But the whole tenor of everything in the gospel is to worship a God who is abounding in grace. Jonathan Edwards said this well. If it is just with God to appoint and permit sin in all mankind, and yet just and reasonable in him to punish forever all sinners, then no one that are thus punished have any reason to complain of the justice of God because of his decree. And if they deserve punishment for their sins, and they do not, or, and they don't deserve it, the less because others are punished, are not punished. You hear that? So because others are not punished, it doesn't mean they deserve it any less. But then if they are pardoned, how does God's saving and pardoning one oblige him to pardon and save another? He is perfectly just and gracious. Temple said this well, and I'll close in prayer. The only thing you contribute to your salvation is your sin that makes it necessary. Jesus offers a kingdom, but it's an outrageous one because no one there will deserve it. And it'll be because of his cross. Let's pray. Thank you, Father for the grace you have shown. Help us to see and to make much of the Christ who was crucified. Help us to see the lesson that we might not think of ourselves as first and being treated as though we're last. But may we think of ourselves as last, not deserving anything, totally lost, and yet receiving full payment because of the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To his name be all glory, and may we find joy in worshiping him. Amen.